us worship God this morning. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the King. Then on the third, at break of dawn, the Son of Heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your sting? The angels roar for Christ the church today is easter sunday it is resurrection sunday and today we celebrate our risen king our resurrected savior and our victorious lord he has triumphed over sin and death he has won over sickness and disease so this morning wherever you are whether you're in tampanese whether you're in woodlands whether you're at home when you just begin to respond to the lord we just begin to worship him begin to lift up a song of praise song of declaration, a song of thanksgiving. He has made a way for us. Amen. Sing with us this day of thanksgiving, this thing of this day of victory. Let us give praise to him and sing a hallelujah to him. Sing with me. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the I raise a hallelujah My weapon is a melody I raise a hallelujah And heaven comes to fight for me Come on
thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us. Lord, we thank you that you came to rescue us. You are our Savior. You are our God. And today we give our hearts to you again, Lord, like you gave your body on that cross. And we thank you that you are alive. Amen. Amen. Yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus.
thank you that Lord in you we have hope in you we have a future and a hope thank you God we just want to trust in you Lord we just want to trust in you God and how great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain I could not climb in desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving kindness thought through the shadows of my soul the work is finished the end is written jesus christ my living hope yes you are god and who could imagine so great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, the cross has spoken, I am forgiven.
Father, we just want to thank you for today, for Resurrection Sunday, because God, you are alive. The tomb is empty, it is finished, and you are alive. So we just want to declare your praise. And we thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, we give him praise. Amen. Praise the Lord and a very, very blessed Resurrection Sunday to one and all. There's a beautiful verse in the Song of Songs. It's in chapter 4, verse 16, and it talks about the adversity of the north winds. They blow and they cause a lot of havoc and damage, but you know, it goes on to then speak about the southern winds. And it's the southern winds that bring the comfort, that bring the blessing, and that bring the joy. And you know, that's what Resurrection Sunday is all about. Amen. So no matter what your situation, many have been going through great time of adversity. The north winds have been blowing and they have been blowing very strongly. Today, the southern winds are blowing and new life is coming to the body of Christ. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord another clap offering. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, at this time, we certainly want to welcome one and all here in Tampanese and also over at Woodlands and also everyone who is visiting us online too. A very, very warm welcome to you. Blessed Resurrection Sunday to all. Now, we'd like to take this opportunity to also welcome anyone, uh, whether here in Tampanese or over in Woodlands, you're here for the very first time. If you are, could I just ask if you could just slip up your hand? Just slip up your hand so we can recognize you. It's one over here. Thank you. Welcome. God bless you. Anyone here over in Woodlands, the same? Wonderful. It's so wonderful to have you with us to join us. And we also know that there will be many online who will be watching us for the very first time. We welcome you also. And we ask that you would take note of the QR code that is at the bottom of your screen. And if you would just tap into that, it's our way to be able to make a connection with you right into us so that we can then connect with you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, one announcement that we want to make, and it's a continual announcement. So people who do come to join us, for our Sunday services, we want to remind you with regard to the Trace Together requirements. You will be required to check into the centers via safe entry in the Trace Together app or the token. So make sure you have it either downloaded on your device or you have the token with you when you come to visit us at either of our worship centers. There's more information on that with Lighthouse News and also some other news. We ask that you take note. Amen. Hey family, it's so good to see you in church. Here are some gentle reminders when attending the live worship services in church. Entry into the centres are strictly by ticket only and the booking of tickets is applicable to ages 13 and above. You will be required to check into the centres via safe entry in the Trace Together app or token. Do ensure you have the app downloaded and registered on your device or have your Trace Together token collected at your nearby community centre before attending the live worship service. To find out where you can collect your token, go to token.goware.gov.sg. For further information regarding Trace Together, please refer to the link below. Let's all adhere to these measures so that we can enjoy a great time back in church. Miss last week's message? Or looking to revisit a message you have heard? Subscribe to our YouTube channel today. Although we are unable to meet physically, Keep up to date with us through Facebook or Instagram. What are you waiting for? Follow us on our social media platforms today. Do also check out our official website at lighthouse.org.sg. Praise the Lord. At this time, we'd like to prepare our hearts as we prepare our tithes and offerings to give on to the Lord. Uh, for those of you who are here in Tampanese and at the Woodland Center, uh, we want to remind you that there are offering boxes that are provided as you exit the facility. And for those of you who are at home viewing the broadcast 
or any, maybe even here at the centers and you prefer to give online, you can opt to give via pay now or internet banking, and uh, which you can see the information is there on your screen. So let's prepare our hearts as we give unto the Lord. Have you ever uh, taken note of the, the widow lady who gave of her two mites? And, you know, as she was giving of her two mites, there were many, many others who were also providing offerings into the treasury. But the Lord took note of this particular woman. You, you see, it's, it's not the amount of the offering. You know, God is God. He really doesn't need our offering. That's not something a pastor probably should say at a time like this. But what it is, it's an opportunity for you and I to demonstrate our appreciation and love for God. Abel gave a better offering because he gave an offering by faith, meaning that he saw God as worthy of receiving his very best. Father, we thank you for this opportunity and privilege that we have now. Father, we thank you that you gave your very best in the giving of your son. And today we celebrate the resurrection, Lord, unto new life. And, and Lord, we just pray that as we give unto you, that our motive would be one of love, a motive of worship, Lord, as we give unto you because you are worthy. You are worthy of our very best. And so, Lord, as the offering is given to you, we pray that you would bless it, anoint it, and, Lord, that it would be used to facilitate and extend your kingdom here in Singapore and to the nations of the earth. And we thank you, and we ask this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
It's time to listen to what God has for us this weekend. Let us quieten our hearts and welcome Pastor Pace to time as he shares today's message. Wow, praise God. And so good to see all of you. Today is a Resurrection Sunday. You know what that means? It means that it's a day we celebrate the fact that Jesus is not in the grave. And, you know, when I was a young boy in church, I I really was not concerned about Jesus. I was not thinking about what he represents and he died for my sin. I don't even think I'm that bad. And why should I bother that he rose again? You know, but when you and I come to know that there's a savior who really did die for our sin and that despite the fact you and I deserve condemnation, the fierce anger of God and hell, despite all that, but yet Jesus still came for us. Uh, it, is, it is an amazing thing. I, I'm here to just remind you that there's no one that loves you more like Jesus. There's no one. That, if you, you can say there's someone, it's impossible because that person is not pure enough, it's not holy enough, it's not righteous, it's not, that person is not loving enough to actually die for your mistake and your sin. On Resurrection Sunday, the tomb was rolled away and the ladies went in and said, wait a minute, where is Jesus' body? We came to pay our respects. And they only saw the cloth, but the body was not there. The angel told the ladies, why are you looking here? He's not here. He's risen. He's alive. And, and you know, when you and I come to faith in Christ, and you say, Pastor, I felt alive when I came to Christ. It's because Jesus was alive. If Jesus stayed dead, then your faith is based on a dead man's false words. But the reason why you and I can have joy and peace in the Holy Spirit and enjoy the fellowship of God is because Jesus was exactly who He said He was. He was and is and it's to come. He's the Messiah, the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords, and He is your God and your Savior. Today, I want to talk to you about Born to a Living Home, and we're starting a new book, and, I, and this book is going to be so rich because it's written by the chief of the apostles, and that is not the Apostle Paul, but Peter. Peter was with Jesus for the three years, and Peter was the one that denied Christ, but Peter was restored later on. And Peter was really the leader of the apostles. Brash, bold, arrogant Peter, later transformed by the power of God on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit came upon him and he shared the words and 3,000 people came to faith on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2, amazing. So he is the writer of this book, First Peter. And, and I, I want to take the word with a breath of fresh air and enjoy it. You know, uh, I've been a Christian for so long, like many of you, and there are times we look at the Word of God in a very boring and chore-like way, and I hope we don't do that starting from today. And so, would you please, let's pay reverence to the Lord, and in the reading of the Word, would you please, uh, let's honor the Lord by standing up for a moment, and as I read the passage, come on, just stand up for a moment. Just seven verses, and as I read these words, I pray that the words of God will wash over us, okay? Just hear the words of God. As I say it, it's it's a human voice, but beneath the words is spirit unction. Beneath the words is Holy Ghost power. Beneath the words are the truth of life and death. So hear this now, church. It's recorded in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. L- listen to this. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. Wow. Wow. Just say that in your heart. May grace and peace be multiplied to me. Thank you, Lord. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I'll say that again. Blessed be the 
God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. And hear this, church. In this you rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Hear this, church. The Lord knows the aches, the pains, the burdens, the tribulations you go through, but this is just but for a short... Wow. Wow. The last verse, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honour at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Church, this is God's Word. Let's give thanks and pray. Lord, we receive your Word this morning and it's your Word that changes lives. It's your Word that transforms our hearts. It's your word that gives us direction and it's the course of action by which we take upon the Holy Spirit. Lord, guide us. You are the shepherd and we are your sheep and we can go astray left on our own device, but you are the Lord of hosts and you lead us into truth. Your word is truth. And so right now, oh God, speak to us. Your church, we want to be hungry for you, oh God hungering after the Holy Ghost, after your presence, after the sweet fellowship that comes in the Trinity. Lord, may your word speak to us. In Jesus' name and all of us say amen. Please be seated. Thanks for standing for the reading of the word. And we have a few key points and it's such a rich passage. For the last three months that I was on sabbatical, I was taking time to pray and think about what the Lord has for this church. And also, uh, 1 Peter is really a phenomenal book. Like, I know all pastors are supposed to say that, but let's be honest, you know, even those of you that are here as pastors or leaders, there are times that, you know, we tell fellow Christians, oh man, this is a great book, or we're excited about this, but actually not quite. And sometimes our emotions do not match our expectations. Sometimes the reality does not match where we really need to be. So, you know, Jesus is Lord, yay, you know. Jesus died for my sins, yeah. Jesus rose again, huh? And, and, and something can get lost along the way. First Peter is, is a phenomenal book because Peter is not writing to Christians that have it easy. He's writing to Christians that are dispersed and exiled, Christians that are persecuted, Christians that have to hang on to Jesus for dear life. And you and I might kind of know that a bit more in this COVID-19 season, a bit more, that we realize that so many pillars that we held in this life, in this precious country called Singapore, can be fleeting, not because the nation is bad, but because life takes a roller coaster ride. And things that happen many times are beyond our control, and we're trying to grapple at straws and sticks and trying to hold our life together. And some of you know exactly what I'm saying. You've been trying to control your life. You said, you know, Pastor, 2020, 2021, I'm going to take hold of my life. And you say, whoa, my life is spinning out of control. This book is going to help you a lot. So let's get down to the first thing. And I want you to write down notes. The first thing I want you to write is salvation leads to sanctification and obedience to Christ. Now, here's what happens, guys. When we get saved, when the Holy Spirit saves us through the gospel, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. So when we hear the gospel and we realize we're a sinner in need of salvation, and then we come and commit our lives to Jesus, right? We surrender our sins and place faith in Him. Uh, the Bible is going to show us that when we are saved, it leads to sanctification. You say, what's that big word, Pastor? It really just means growing in holiness, growing in obedience, growing in faith. There is growth. Now, at, as Christians, sometimes we do stagnate. And I'm not sure about you, but those seasons are horrible, right? Because when we stagnate in faith, suddenly the things we do, 
serving the needs of the church or in our family, it becomes very laborious and very chorish. <laughs> There's no such word, but it's a chore, so chorish, you know. And, and some of us know what it's like. It feels like there's always this burden to perform, to do, to act. But the truth is we need to go back to whence we first came from, the joy of God's salvation for us. If we are saved in Christ, it leads us to grow in Him. And you know what the Bible says are the fruits of the Spirit? Things that we want, church, that sometimes we don't have them or we don't find them with us. Joy! I've never asked someone and said, hey, do you want more joy or misery in your life? No one says, pastor, sign me up for more misery. Everyone says, I want more joy. Peace. Who wants peace? I want peace. I don't want to sleep at night and thinking whether the loan sharks, creditors, people are coming after me, right? Peace. Patience, kindness, long-suffering. We want the fruits of the Holy Spirit to be with us. And if you are saved there will be a growth in your spirit to sanctification. If you say, Pastor, there's no growth right now, you have to ask a very tough question. Where are the choke points? What is hindering your fellowship in God? And very likely, very likely, it's an area of our life that is not surrendered to Him. It could be even something seemingly good like a hobby, basketball sewing, cooking, something that's good, but it's in the way. It's not always has to be sin in the real sense of the word. Sometimes it can be a good thing turned into a bad thing. What have we placed before the Lord that is more precious to us now than Jesus Christ? And that's why God has to come to Abraham and says, give me your son. I'm going to test your faith, Abraham. Give me your beloved son, Isaac sacrificed him for me. And Abraham obeyed. So Abraham is saying to God, Lord, I don't want my fellowship with you to be hindered. I am going to literally act upon the fact when I say, Lord, you are number one, you are number one. I got to do it. And for some of us, there are things that is hindering our joy. You need to know that there are things that is hindering your fellowship with God. So salvation leads to sanctification and obedience to Christ. Look at what it says in verse 2. According to the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit, look, look at what it says. For obedience to Jesus Christ. Honest time of confession. For many years, even though I call myself a Christian, I disobeyed God and I was good at it. I was good at disobeying God in a way that perhaps church folk like you wouldn't know, but God knows. The Spirit knows. And the Spirit is grieved. The problem with disobedience, when we as God's children disobey God, it's grieving the Holy Spirit. You say, Pastor, I don't understand. Here's a simple fact. If you're a grandparent or a parent, when your child makes a mess of his life, you grieve. Now, if your son or daughter sees it wrongly, he thinks you're being nosy, naggy, and yeah, why you control me, Papa? But for you, is you're more grieved than angry. You see, the heart of the parent understands. And you and I, so imperfect, already knows how to feel grief when our children is in a bad place. How much more? How much more? The Holy Spirit is grieved when you and I willfully disobey Him. We, we do not want to go by His commands. He's grieved. It is about obedience to Christ. And you say, Pastor, I've not been obeying God for many years. I'm not here to judge you. Guess what? I was in your shoes. But there must be something, Christian, brother or sister, that causes you to say, Lord, I'm going to take my faith seriously. I'm going to place faith in Christ, which means not only, oh, I'm saved from hell, but I'm saved unto life, and I'm saved to obey you, I'm saved to rejoice, I'm saved to serve. Obedience to God. And I think something along the line in the last 20 years in global Christianity, the word obedience has been totally taken away from the vocabulary. And you know what, church? It's time to put back the word obedience back in the church. Can someone say a good amen? 
you know, you know, you know some of us would face less problems if our sons and daughters obeyed, our grandchildren obeyed, our employees obeyed, our colleagues obeyed, our bosses obeyed the Lord. Like, you, you know the beauty of obedience is all is well with our soul. Disobedience leads to so much pain. And I want to tell you, friend, if you are disobeying God, the Lord is still patient and He's wooing you back and He's asking you, look back at the fact you were saved. So you got to grow. And growing is not growing in disobedience. Growing is growing in the love of God. Sanctification, growing in your life, in your spirit to God. We get to the next point. Write this down. Being born again is the greatest blessing one can receive. I tell you honestly, friends, for many years, I did not believe this. I believe that having a Maserati or Ferrari is the best gift, you know. I believe that having a very pretty girlfriend is the greatest blessing, right? And the enemy lies to us that the greatest blessing is found outside of Jesus Christ. Church, perish the thought. That is not for the saints. The world wants to chase what the world wants. For you and I, as for you and I, we chase after the presence of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We chase after the mercies of God. We come into His presence with thanksgiving. So this is so important. Look at verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Look at the exclamation mark there. When Peter was writing this episode, there was joy bubbling in his heart. Remember what I said, for many years I'm not interested. So, you know, in the past, if I see this, I say, okay, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me try to demystify it and kind of logically try to explain what this means. Yeah, you are blessed, oh God, because you are God, but what does it do for me? See, the selfish carnal man, even if we come to church, is always looking at what is it good for me? What's in it for me, Lord? But you know something? God is deserving of worship. Listen, whether you and I worship Him or not. You know when the Bible says something so amazing, it says that every knee shall bow and confess that Christ is Lord. You said, what? But there are a lot of atheists, agnostic, people from different faiths, people that hate Jesus. One day they will bow down to Him Yes, they will. On judgment day, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. You say, but at judgment day, wouldn't there be people sent to heaven and sent to hell? Yes. Even those that are going to hell would finally acknowledge too late though. Too late. Their knee is bowed, but now it's not because of volition on earth. It's now because they finally see, oh, no, Jesus is really Lord and King. He was the creator of the universe and He died for my sins and on my life on earth. I did not receive and respond the gospel message and all eternity weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because their knees were not bowed and their tongue did not confess that Christ is Lord here on earth. And I'm not talking about empty, vain, conceited speech. I'm not talking about false worship, and sometimes we might give that to the Lord, that the people might worship the Lord with their lips, but their hearts are far away. And trust me, I, I know what it's like to worship the Lord with my lips because I'm supposed to do it as a Christian, as a pastor's kid, and as a pastor myself, but my heart is far away. And I tell you honestly, it's the worst feeling in the world to know that you're not what you're supposed to be in Christ, to know that you're not cleansed and made whole, to know that you're not walking in step with the Holy Spirit, to know that you are not living a life that is righteous before God. Before men, they might think you're righteous, but they do not know your hidden thoughts and your hidden deeds in the dark of night. But before God, to be cleansed and be whole and be pure and be undefiled and being made perfect, the Bible would say. See, some of these things, as I say to you now, to be friends, to be friends with you, brothers and sisters, some of you will be, Pastor, I'm still not quite sure what you're saying. And I, and I pray that you will get there by the Lord, because the Lord was patient with me. How many weeks when I came to church and 
I'm like, oh gosh, another sermon to hear, another song to sing. Oh, when will this end? But when we finally see the Spirit real and the mercies of God are new every morning, suddenly it's like, it's joy, it's joy. It's not chore, it's joy. And so if you say, Pastor, I find it a chore, you know what? I understand and I'm telling you it's wrong. I'm not saying it's right, it's wrong. And I'm not here to condemn you, but it's wrong. And it's time you rekindle that love to God and say, God, if you are really who you say you are, when Peter says, blessed be the God our Father, why isn't this in my soul? What's going on inside of me? Am I so dead and hollow inside that I can't resonate with the truth of God? And you know what? The Lord will lead you to that true friend. And then suddenly you rekindle what you first had. You know, some of you came to Christ 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, maybe even 50 years ago. And those days was awesome. Now it's like, mm, we're just going to do church. But friends, I, I, I want, honestly, I, I do not, I'm not thinking of myself or how you view me or I'm supposed to be a pastor to people. Finally, when it's all said and done, when we meet God in Judgment Day, everything is exposed. Everything is clean before Him. Everything is shown before Him. So now, while there's time on earth, we need to really bend our knee. We really need to exalt the Lord. We need to confess our sins, turn and abandon sin, and place our full faith I'll wait on Him. I'll trust in Him here on earth. And you see what the Lord is going to do. He's going to rekindle that joy you had, that childlike faith you had. He's going to tear off some things. It's going to be painful because some of you are going to lose certain things that is so dear to you. The Lord will ask you to give up your quote-unquote Isaacs or your quote-unquote Rachels. And you have to put these things that have become so important, these shrines of idols before the Lord and say, Lord, burn it up because all I want to see is you. I want to see you, Lord. I want to see who you really are. If you say your love is good, if you say that a day with the Lord is better than a thousand years on earth, if you say that there's great joy to be found, Lord, I want to find that joy. For some of us, we are taking sleeping pills and prescription drugs. For some of us, let's be honest, you are drinking too much. For some of us, we are going into things we should not. You know why? Because our conscience is not right. And there's this bugging guilt. And there's this nagging feeling like our life is not in the right place it should be. And you and I need on Resurrection Sunday to rekindle and realize that it's the blood of Christ. It's the blood. You have to see the cross. You have to see the blood. You have to see what Jesus has done. You have to see Him rise from death to life. You have to see that. And once that happens, friends, it's an amazing thing. We can, like Peter says, blessed, blessed, blessed be the God and Father. Look at the verse. It says, according to His great mercy. Look at the words. He has caused us to be born again. Born again. Look at the words. Living hope. Pastor, I feel like my life has no hope. I'm not here to condemn. I understand. I get it. But then maybe your hope has been placed in the wrong people and the wrong things. Don't place your hope even in me or a pastor. It's the wrong place to place your undying affection for. You place your hope in, the Bible says, Jesus Christ. So he causes us to be born again, which means that there's a new man or new woman that rises. The old has gone, the new has come, that we abandon the things of old and surrender fully to the Lord. Let's get to point number three, and we're going to try to finish up three more simple points. There is an eternal inheritance waiting for true believers. And you know what? It is so powerful to know that, that heaven is waiting for believers and there is an inheritance. Some of us would say, but pastor, I'm not sure. And honestly, I've, I've been speaking to different Christians and there's some Christians that say, Lord, I believe, but I'm not sure when I die, would I be with you? And if you can ask those questions, there's only two possibilities. One, you actually have genuine faith, but 
you are placing your gaze on the wrong place, or two, perhaps your conscience is telling you there's a reason why you are saying that because perhaps you are really sliding away from the Lord. And I'm not here to condemn. Again, I'm here to help you because the job of the pastor is to shepherd the flock. And if we, like sheep, go astray, the shepherd's job is to draw us back. So the Lord has done it for me through different people. And give me the permission to do that for you. So don't run from this conversation yet. I know you might not like it. I know when you hear it, it might not sit well. But if you are running from the Lord and somehow you're saying, hey, Lord, honestly, if I die, I don't know whether I'm with you, then those are questions you need to ask. What is it that is in your heart? What's happening in your spiritual life? What's taking place? in your allegiance to the Lord. And you have to surrender everything to Him so that this becomes true. Look at verse 4. To an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter is saying, look, there is an eternal inheritance in heaven. No one can take it from you. You say, Pastor, I don't care about that. I care about now. People are taking my house, my job. People are taking my, uh, you know, people are stealing stuff from me. Scammers are calling me from don't know where, man, India, China, don't know where they're calling up, trying to steal money from me. You see, on earth, things can be stolen from you. That's what the Bible says. Jesus says that you don't work for treasure on earth that moth and rust can destroy and thieves can steal. But store up treasures in heaven that no one can take it from you. And, and here's what happens though sometimes. Let's be honest. As Christians... For much of our life, we are storing up treasures on earth. Can I prove it to you? Hey, how much do I have in my CP ever? Hey, how much am I going to gonna tax this, this year? Hey, where's my side income? Where's my passive income? Hey, is my Bitcoin currency doing well? Is my stocks and shares doing well? Oh, yeah, this company tank already and my stocks are down. And many times we don't even give a thought of eternal inheritance. You say, why is that important? Because the way we function in this life on earth would determine where we are really going to be. If I'm concerned of eternal inheritance, then, for instance, I will look at neighbors and friends and people that are so outside of Jesus, and I'll be thinking, you know, Lord, instead of thinking of my Bitcoin... I'm going to think about right now the eternal Bitcoin in heaven. And the fact that when I share this with someone, I'm actually gaining for myself more and more inheritance in heaven. Now, I know some people don't like to hear that, but I, I tell honestly, thinking about your inheritance in heaven leads us to live a more godly life than thinking of our temporal heaven on earth. And I can say that because the same as you, uh, ever since I got married and have kids, I'm like, kids, you know, wow. Money just flies out, you know. Like, the, <laughs> I always joke this with my wife. Like, I had some money before I got married. When suddenly married, suddenly, hey, my bank account zero. <laughs> and I was like, how did it all disappear, you know? Right? And then you're thinking and you're stressed about the life on earth and how you're going to make it by and how you're going to pay your bills. Well, those things have its fair share of challenges. Was it not Jesus that said that, don't have to fear on those things. He will feed you and He will clothe you. Don't have to worry about your necessities because the Heavenly Father loves you and He will take care of you. And if you say, no la, that's lack of faith. If you said, yes, it's been proven, the Lord has provided for you. You're still here. You still have clothes, you still have food, you still have some place to live. The Lord has provided for you. But you know, friends, is it possible on Resurrection Sunday, if we are trying to look at a risen Savior, is it possible to look at a risen inheritance? Is it possible now we, instead of looking at what's in our bank account or what's not in there, is it possible now that we look at the bank of heaven? The place where our inheritance is undefiled. And you know what's so liberating? Lord, I declare that all my finance on earth I live it in your hands. No banker can 
Secure my finance like you, Lord. My life is in your hands, Lord, so my finance is in your hands. I declare it in your hands. But right now, Lord, while I still time on earth, I'm going to go after and chase and build the eternal inheritance in heaven. And you say, how does that look like? I'm going to live life right. I'm going to share my faith. I'm going to snatch people out of the fire, Jude. I'm going to lead people to know Christ. I'm going to do something to build the kingdom of God. Now, again, for many of you that have heard me before, please know I'm not saying build lighthouse. Build the kingdom of God, meaning things that are so spiritual that you can help Christians outside of lighthouse. You want to serve the purposes of God. That's an inheritance. And it says in verse 5, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. I'm short of time. I want to get to the last two points. Look at the next point, point number four. The testing of faith is part of being a Christian. When you and I have our faith tested, it's not surprising to God. It's something that is so common. It's something that is the rite of passage. And you and I will have to go through that. It's part and parcel. When Abraham was asked by God to give up your son, Isaac, that was a test. It seems unreasonable, but it was a test. Will you do it? And sometimes God comes to us and He asks us, will we give up our Isaac? And we are thinking, Lord, you can't have it, thinking that God wants to shortchange us. Actually, He's leading us to greater glory. You say, how can it be? Remember what happened when Abraham brought Isaac up? And finally, God sends an angel and said, stop, don't kill your son. Check it out. In the thicket, there is a ram, there is a sacrifice in place of Isaac. And so Abraham unties, unfastens the rope from his son, brings him down from the altar, goes, kills the ram, and sacrifices before the Lord. You said, how is that a goodness of God? What was that good? God put Abraham through so much stress. No, God put Abraham through the test. And the test is huge and big and painful, but the test is glorious. Look at the end of the test. Abraham, you passed the test. You rather obey me than to disobey me. You'd rather give your son to me than to withhold your possessions from me. And let's put it in another way, guys. If we say the Lord is the Lord, then everything we have belongs to Him. So the wrestling is there. Lord, I'm suffering. I'm going through pain. There's a testing of my faith. I feel like failing the test. I feel like cheating. I feel like lying. I feel like skirting. I feel like lusting. I feel like having pride. I feel like staying in a place of arrogance. I feel like sinning. I feel like running away. I feel like instead of singing hallelujah, I feel like cursing the heavens. Don't. Hear about the mercies of God once again and be drawn back to His loving kindness and to see that those tests might be painful, but those tests actually refine you to be pure as gold. Look at what the Bible says. It says, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Paul is, uh, Peter is saying, Look, Christians, I know that you're being slaughtered left and right. I know that you're being killed for your faith. I know that you're going through trials. Some of you are put in dungeons. Some of you are put in colosseums. Some of you are being beheaded. Some of you are burned at the stake. Some of you are crucified at the cross. That's what he's saying. For us, it's kind of different. Our sufferings still cannot be compared to what Peter is speaking about. And yet, notice that Peter doesn't lessen the understanding of obedience and testing. Sometimes for us, we lessen it because we said, nah, that's too tough. That's too tough. So, um, you know what? Don't give all your life to God. Just give two parts of your life to God. But we can't do that, friends. We have to unflinchingly go by the Word of God. So, in Peter's day... Christians were being slaughtered left and right and persecuted for their faith. In our day, that's not what we go through right now here in Singapore. So you and I, our testing is way less. So can we shortchange the Lord? We cannot. 
the, the test we go through is meant to purify our faith and purify our lives. You say, Pastor, does the Holy Spirit know I'm going through trials? He does. And what does Peter say? Even through trials, you can rejoice. It's, it's momentarily trials and afflictions. And we come to the last point, and this is going to help. Write this down, point E, genuine faith will bring glory to God. Look at what it says, verse 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here's how I'm going to close, and I want to relate something to you that I, I pray it's going to be so relevant to you. The wrestling that we have is not that our minds do not agree. Like, for instance, if I ask you, hey, friend, hey, brother over there, is Jesus worth it all? You will say, absolutely, pastor. If I say, hey, sister at the back wearing pink, you know, is Jesus worth you giving up everything? You would say, yes, amen. But that's not where the struggle is. The struggle is not, our mind knows that Jesus is worth it all. The struggle is actually doing it. Right? It's, it's like, hey, you know, I have, a, I have a tumor. Go for surgery. It's easy to say it. The mind says it, then you have to do it. So we know Jesus is worth it all. And Peter is saying, guess what? When your faith is being tested, it will prove whether your faith is, listen, genuine or false. And that freaks me out when I was a younger Christian. Because, Lord, what if my faith is tested and it's false? But some of those fears can lead to the fear of the Lord. Because, you know, it's better that we are walking before the Lord with such humility that we're saying to God, God, I, I want to walk right before you, not when people see or don't see. I want to walk right before you in my waking hours, in my sleeping moments. I want to walk right before you. And whatever it is, oh God, I want to have the confession of faith on my lips and the testimony of the Lord in my heart, the rejoicing of the Spirit of God. I, I want to know the Lord. If you ask me for anything, I would say yes, and I would do it. I would do it. And here's where you say, Pastor, if I do it, then I lose out. No, you gain more. You say, huh? You lose your earthly treasures, but what does the Bible declare? You gain heavenly reward. You say, is that what the Bible teaches? Jesus says, if you lose your life for my sake, you will find it. If you try to save your life, you will lose it. Words of Jesus. And that demands a testing. And that's at the place that we wrestle. You say, Pastor, what do I do? I know the Lord is asking me to give up gambling. I know the Lord is asking me to give up pornography. I know the Lord is asking me to give up drinking. I know the Lord is asking me to give up deception. I know the, the Lord is asking me to give up self-mutilation or depression. I know the Lord is asking me to give up this thought life that is not fully surrendered. What do I do? Pastor, what do I do? And the only answer I can give you is see the cross. He said, huh? All our pornography and our deception and our lies and our cheating and our filth and our thievery and our shame all fell upon Jesus. The Bible says that He became sin for us. So on the cross, you see a bloody Savior, but look beyond just the bloody mess of flesh and mangled bone. See on the cross the Savior was sin. You said, huh? Jesus became, not that He was, but He became a thief. He took that thievery on Him. So on the cross, that's why at that point, the Father can't look at Jesus. He has to turn away and Jesus says, why do you abandon me, Father? It's not because the Father hates Jesus, it's because our sins so filthy was upon Jesus. 
And the father looks away and says, oh, I can't look at this. This is too unholy. Jesus took your sins and mine. And on three days after, he rose again from death to life, signifying your sins and mine put to death at the cross. And we rise up like new men and women. You said, Pastor, I don't think that's possible because I've heard from the Christian community around the world that we can't change. I heard from the Christian community, it's okay lah, you know, Christian and non-Christian can do exactly the same. I'm here to tell you, flat out lie from hell, flat out lie from Satan. The Christian brother or sister, we are new in Christ. That means all our filth, all our junk has to, not just, not just say in church, huh? has to be destroyed and taken away. You have to hear it. It has to be an actual fact. I was blind, but now I can see. I was lustful, but now I'm made pure. I was prideful, but now I'm humbled by God. I was rejoicing in my sin, but now we rejoice in the presence of God. Can I make one final appeal? I know I'm, I'm out of time. I, and this is my first week back, so I got a lot to share. But can, can I say this one thing very quickly for your soul? Some of you said, Pastor, I know what you're saying is true, but I'm going to put it off to next week, next month. Don't do that. The Bible declares that today, if you hear the voice of God, today, if you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart, the Bible declares, Hebrews. Do not harden your heart as the forefathers did in the rebellion in the wilderness, but incline your ear unto the saints of God and trust Him in all your ways and today can be a day of such great rebirth. You say, but pastor, I've been a Christian. It's time to be reborn again. It's time to have new hope again. It's time to have new life again. It's time to take back what the enemy has stolen. The enemy has stolen not your money, not your health, but the enemy has stolen your obedience to God, your allegiance to Christ and your joy that can be found in the Holy Spirit. Now, would you stand with me right now? And let me say a quick prayer over you and we'll take communion and we'll be dismissed. But if some of you have heard this urgent plea that I'm saying to you right now, don't ignore it because it's not from a man called Pesatan. It's from the Holy Spirit. And whatever I said for the last half an hour, I can assure you it's Scripture. And you can be led to new life new life in God. The old has gone. The new has come. I don't want the stuff of the old. I want everything that is Jesus. Give me Jesus. And then all of a sudden, guys, we can say like Peter, blessed be the God, our Father, in Jesus Christ. Let me say a prayer. Lord, I'm not sure who this is for, but I was so compelled to share this because ultimately, when we stand on judgment day, it's got to be all of us that enter into the kingdom of heaven. It's got to be all of us that is found in your courts with praise. We, we have to have our faith purified by the Lord. We have to have our sins cleansed and we're walking right in the presence of God. And so whichever brother or sister is hearing this, Lord, would you bring holy conviction? holy writ to holy scripture and hearts that can be purified from a guilty conscience unto new life for all eternity and lastly oh god there is an eternal inheritance for every born again brother or sister because now we have entered from death to life just as jesus rose from death to life so Lord, right now, I'm going to pray for this, friends, and please receive this. Lord, if holy conviction has come, then may the fire of the Holy Spirit so consume our hearts that you're burning away the dross, you're burning away the doubt, you're burning away anything that competes for love of God. And something will come upon us, not only the Holy Spirit, there's going to be new joy. Would you receive that right now? Lord, we receive new joy and new peace a new unction in Jesus name and all of us say could you give the Lord praise in this place amen praise God now stay standing because we got to do Holy Communion and would you please take your elements right now please I'll give you a moment to prepare
what you're holding in your hands, as you know, we've done this so often, is the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus died for you and I. So right now, consider the words of Scripture. Jesus, after supper, broke bread, gave thanks to the Father, gave it out to His disciples and said, this is my body that's broken for you. Do this, eat this in remembrance of me. Church, can we partake it together with thanksgiving? After supper, Jesus poured out the wine in the chalice, gave thanks to God and gave to His disciples and said, this is my blood of the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins for many. Drink this, do this in remembrance of me. Church, can we partake it together? Let's pray. Lord, it's all about you. And we want it to be true, Lord. The body, the blood, it's about Christ. Cleanse us, forgive us, restore us, renew us. Do whatever that's necessary, O oh God, so that true genuine conviction of your cross, your blood, your sacrifice and your resurrection will come to light in our hearts. Lord, we give you thanks in Jesus' name and all of us say, Amen. Please be seated. Praise God. We hope you have been blessed at Lighthouse Evangelism. If this is your first time with us, let's get connected. Reach us through this website or QR code below and we'll be in touch with you shortly. for joining us online. If you have any queries, please visit our website at lighthouse.org.sg. We hope you have been blessed. See you again next week.